Good evening and welcome to Wilmette Public Library. I'm Anthony Austin, Director of the Library. Thank you for joining us for our first ever virtual author event. Tonight's online program follows 15 years of outstanding in-person events hosted by the library, featuring such exceptional authors as Ann Patchett, Richard Russo, Jane Smiley, and Colin McCann. This virtual format builds on our past successes and enables us to invite more viewers than ever before. In fact, tonight we're joined by nearly 500 of you. We're so happy that you've joined us from near and far tonight. Before I introduce our guest, a bit of housekeeping. First, just to let you know how our program is gonna proceed this evening. We are using Zoom webinar for tonight's event, which means as an attendee, you are only able to see and hear us, the panelists. All participants are muted and your videos are also off. Mr. Cooper will speak first, followed by a Q&A led by librarians Amy Barrow and Barbara Goodman. If you have a question for Mr. Cooper, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Amy and Barb will be getting to as many of those questions as time allows after Mr. Cooper's talk. Next, if you haven't read Arshay Cooper's memoir, contact Wilmette Public Library or your own local public library to borrow a copy. If you wish to purchase a copy of the book, we invite you to do so from Semicolon, a Black woman-owned bookstore in Chicago that is partnering with us for this event. While we can't provide our regular in-person book signing for this virtual program, anyone who purchases a copy of the book from Semicolon will receive a special book plate signed by the author. Watch for a follow-up email from the library that will include ordering information and a link to the <laughs> bookstore's website. Lastly, I'd like to invite you to our next author event. On Monday, November 9th at 6 p.m. Central Time, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, number one New York Times bestselling author, National Book Award winner, and historian, will discuss his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. This program, presented in partnership with 10 other Chicago area libraries, is free and open to the public, but registration is required. You can sign up on Wilmette Public Library's website. And now, our main event. We are absolutely delighted to welcome author Arshay Cooper this evening. If you have read A Most Beautiful Thing or seen the documentary of the same name, you know that Arshay grew up on the west side of Chicago, where he was captain of the Manly High School rowing team, the first all-black high school rowing team in the country. You also know that this was an experience that changed Arshay's life, and I'm sure we're going to hear much more about that this evening. A Most Beautiful Thing seemed to us to be the perfect book to feature during these challenging times. While the book highlights issues of racial disparity and injustice, our shape also provides the reader with great inspiration and hope as his infectious and positive spirit shines through. The book, which Arshe originally self-published in 2015 with the title Sugar Water, was published um, with a new title this year in conjunction with the release of the documentary, A Most Beautiful Thing, which is narrated by Common, executive produced by Grant Hill and Dwayne Wade, and directed by Mary Mazio. Both the book and the film have been received to wide acclaim. Just this week, we learned that basketball superstar Steph Curry selected A Most Beautiful Thing for his book club, Underrated, which is designed to include powerful stories uh, of people who defy the odds to break barriers and achieve true greatness. True greatness definitely defines Arche. After high school, he spent two years with AmeriCorps, focusing on diversity and inclusion, and then he attended Le Cordon Bleu, becoming a personal chef for events and professional athletes. Later, Arche returned to his true passion, working with young people. He coached rowing at the Chicago Urban Youth Rowing Club and worked as a youth program guidance counselor. He has also started several rowing programs for low-income youth across the country so that other young people can experience the profound change that can happen on the water. He now speaks at events and venues far and wide, from prisons to colleges to professional sports teams. He serves as a motivational speaker and an activist, particularly around issues of accessibility for low-income families. We are honored to have him join us at the library tonight. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, author Arshay Cooper. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I am so happy to be with the library tonight and it's just a pleasure to be able to share some of the, the love and the joy that this book and our film has been receiving this far. But before we go into the Q&A, I just wanna talk a little bit about the process um, of making this book happen and a little bit of, of my story. 
of make of writing this book, you know, I was a chef and I went to Le Cordon Bleu, started working with WW Wrestling as a personal chef. I worked with Warner Brothers, started traveling the world as uh, a, 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 a private and a personal chef. But my journey took me to speaking at this school in Brooklyn, right near the Marcy Projects. The name of the school was called Beginning with Children Charter School. And I was speaking to all young men that were in seventh grade. And I remember talking about my mother and I'm sharing the story of my relationship with her. And this kid just start punching a desk in the middle of my speech. And I've never seen anything like this before. And I said, hey, you, want, you okay? You wanna talk about it? And he shook his head now. And so I went on. And then he started yelling, my mom's so stupid, my mom's so stupid. And the after school director said, hey, leave the classroom if you're gonna interrupt the classroom. And I said, no, it's okay. Because the look in his eyes were, were very familiar. And as I carry on and continue to talk and continue to speak, he said, you know, I, I live in the Marcy Projects and, and, and my stepdad told my mom to move and she wouldn't move. And my mom was murdered a month ago there. And I didn't know what to say at that moment. And before I was able to say something, another kid raised his hand and he said, my uncle died in that same building. And so all these young men began sharing their stories. And as a chef and as a person who did very well as a chef, I began to live those years in the 90s in the city of Chicago. And so I threw myself and gave myself away to speaking to young people. And going back home to Chicago and hearing the stories of some of these young kids who want the roadmap to how to be successful, right? How do they take their, their, their talents and their commitments and their resilience, where they live in a place that's so neglected and so mistreated, what is the roadmap to coming successful? And I knew at that moment that I had to write something. I may give them my way and maybe a few answers, but how can I spread this story of hope, this story of a group of young men who didn't like each other at first, but the water gave them new life? How can I share that story to the world? And on my journey, I began to go to writers' conferences and, and I started writing. And then I began speaking to agents and every agent, every literary agent that I talked to or editor would ask me one question. And that question was, did you win? How many medals did you win? How many championships did you win? And the answer was none. Individually, I've won races, but as a team, we didn't win. And because we didn't win, I was not able to land a literary agent or editor. And so I began to write and self-publish. So I locked myself in a room and, and watched a ton of YouTube videos on how to write a memoir. And I started reading books by Antoine Fisher, by Joan Diddy, and all these writers who can really paint the picture in the pages. And it was truly a most beautiful thing to read those stories. But what I learned by re reflecting on this story is that these young men who grew up so hard, these young men who skipped over pools of blood, who heard gunshots when they slept, who ran for their lives, who lost friends, whose experience what most soldiers have experienced in war before, even bef before they were 15 years old, have seen a lot. But we all got together and for an hour and a half, we would travel to the boathouse and we were committed to this foreign sport. And to me, that was a win. We culturally, overcame the fear of water and that was a big fear. And to me, that was a win. Getting different gang members who did not like each other at first into one boat and become a brotherhood and form a brotherhood, that was a win. To get young black men to activate their entrepreneurial mindset and sit in class and take it serious and grow up to all become entrepreneurs and hire people from their community is a win. And so I wrote that story knowing that we all are winners, that we all survive. And writing knowing that this is not a charity story, but a story that when young people get an opportunity, when they get access, that they rise. And the beauty that we felt on the water was something special. 
we not only went through trauma, but our grandparents went through trauma and they saw a lot. And that's why they moved to Chicago. After my grandma seeing her best friend hung on a tree, she moved. After Malcolm's mom, brother was hung on a tree, she moved to Chicago. And they were redlined and they, they, it was hard for them to advance or get a loan or take out a mortgage because of the color of their skin. But still they had hope. And they raised beautiful sons and daughters who have hope today. And I think what we experienced in the water was something special. When I first got out there and I was pushed out in open water, I have never been downtown. And I remember seeing the John Hancock building. It, it was beautiful. And I feared the water. But as a survivor on the west side of Chicago, fear and survival also speaks to you. And what survival mode told me, to, in order to get back to the dock safely, we must pull for each other. And we began to pull for each other. And to pull for each other, you must shut up and listen. And that's when the coxswain and the coach come in and they say, sit tall, breathe. You belong here. You have a purpose. And once we build that connection on the water, once we found alignment, we found the magic in the boat. And then we began to download serenity. There were no sounds of gunshots. There was no police sirens. There was no bullying. There was no broken street glass. It was purely meditative. Some of us meditate half hour a day, but to be out there two hours a day near that water, collecting our thoughts, feeling the peace that we all felt near the ocean was truly beautiful. And some teachers will say we were a walking storm, but the sport of rowing was the only sport that calmed the storm in us. And the lessons we learned, we all use today in our lives. And that's why I'm so happy to share this story the story that shows that talent is everywhere, but it's access and opportunity that is not. And when opportunity presents itself, what are some of the hesitations? What are some of the systemic obstacles that we face? And the importance of representation and also to truly inspire and motivate everyone. The biggest lesson I learned in the sport of rowing is I think a, a lesson that we all can use in this country is, that, and is this, that I can't do the work of eight people in a boat but I need eight people to do the work and we'll get there much faster. And sometimes we have a boat of four pulling the eight and it's heavy and it's hard. But if we all pull together in one direction, we would truly get there. And so I'm excited to share my story with you guys. And I'm excited about this Q&A. And Amy Barber, I'm, I, I'm excited to, to get started. Okay, Arshe, thank you so much for um, sharing all of that with us. And I know how busy you are. I know this is your third program today. So we're thrilled that you've gotten so busy. Um, and please remember that you can ask a question by clicking the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen and we'll get to as many as we can. So here's the first one we're gonna start with. Um, you were quoted as saying that your team was going to change the sport of rowing, but instead rowing changed you. How did the sport change your future and that of your teammates despite the adversity you faced? Yeah, you know, it, it, it wasn't really just showing up and the boat was there and the oars were there. It was truly the youth development coaches, the coaches that not only came into our community and said, give us these kids, but wanted to build relationships with the moms who wanted to know the teachers in the school, right? And wanted to be in our lives. We live in a place where sometimes it was rough on teachers, but because it was so rough, a lot of times we had security guards and people in the neighborhood talking at us. And the coaches really talked with us. They asked questions like, what keeps you up at night? What keeps you going? And we had icebreakers and they had great conversation starters for us to get to know each other. And although the world was on fire around us, the, the fire inside of us burned brighter. And that's because the coaches gave us the education and the conversations and the opportunity to be able to trust and learn each other, learn about each other. Um, there were books that we read and, and, and there was trips that we went to where we was able to experience a different world. And, um, and, and, and that was the thing that, that um, truly uh, made, it, made an impact. 
Right. So if we get kind of to, well, one question has just come in, kind of getting down to the basics, which is how did you and your fellow rowers get over your fear of the water? Yeah, so, you know, if you read the book, we, we did have to swim. We still, we had to learn how to swim. And back then, I think that, you know, one thing that was important is, was language. So it wasn't just swim test. Swim test was very scary. But water confidence kind of helped. You, wanna, you need to learn water confidence, right? And spending time in that pool and uh, helped us a little bit. But I think being out on the water, again, that the fear was so strong that we paid attention, right? Um, we feared the water so much that we knew the importance of listening to the coach, right? And, and I think that is what helped us, um, learning to feel the connection in the boat because we feared the water so much and actually really just spending as much time as we can. And quite, quite honestly, people would, you think the boat would flip, but we also knew that you know, a huge eight boat won't flip. And we trusted our coaches and we spent six months before even getting on the water, learning to trust them. It wasn't just like, hey, here's this new program. It's time to put you on the water. We spent six months building a connection with them and trusting them and learning about them and them learning about us. And then we were ready to go. And, um, and so listening to them and, and hearing their voice and them guiding us knew that, um, that we'd be, we knew that we'd be okay. Um, here's another one. So what gave you the drive at such a very young age to know that you wanted a different life than what you had in your childhood? Yeah, you know, it, it was my mom's change. I didn't, I didn't believe in hope until I saw her change. And I would go, I was intrigued with change because I was like, that woman would never change, you know? And she changed, completely changed. And I would sit in those meetings with her, with the, all those who were drug addicts. And they would share their beautiful story of how they change and then how their kids change because they change and how you could be a leader and I wanted to give that hope to the world. And I think the second thing was those black TV shows. Um, it was a different world uh, that showed me that as a skinny little kid that you, you, you can be great and you can give back to the place that gave to you. It was Family Matters, Steve Urkel, who taught me how to treat a woman at a young age, right? And how to be patient. And I was a patient guy in, 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 uh, in high school. And it was also the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, Will Smith Road, that taught me that taught me even without a father, that you can have true joy, right? And so those shows were my my church service. It was my Sunday service, and I learned a lot from those shows. And I, I took notes and write poetry because of those shows, and, uh, and and that gave me the drive because they looked like me, and they had different lives, and so that showed me that I can I can get there. So here's a question um, about the, the difference between the two books, or if there is a difference between. So I think maybe if you want to explain to the viewers first about that Sugar Water was self-published and about the newer books. The question is, I've read both of your books. Personally, I enjoyed Sugar Water better. I even read a few of the passages to my nine-year-old son that I thought were impactful. I'd like to ask why a change of tone between the two books, even though it was the same story. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, I think that <laughs> when you uh, sign a deal with a big publishing house, they um, <laughs> they uh, they take a little bit of control, right? And and but they get your book out to the world, um, you know, and and I get to do a lot of tours and, and good stuff like that. But I think that um, the first book was me just taking everything from my notes and my journal and in my head and putting it into a book. Sugar Water was for me. I wrote it for me. It, it was me releasing everything that I talked about. I have never talked to, to, to anyone about some of this stuff, right? And when I got all those, all those thoughts onto paper, I felt like I lost a lot of weight. I felt good. That, that was therapy. That writing was therapy for me. And so it was for me and, uh, and for young people at Manly. And um, I would say the second book that, you know, I focused a little bit more on rowing and, 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 and the power of the sport. And, and, and that is my life. And that's what I do, give kids the opportunity to be a part of the sport. But I say the biggest difference is that there's a lot of just 
stories of random thoughts that were really good thoughts and stuff that uh, I only only talked to about talked to maybe close friends about. And then the other book was more for like the people out in the world and, and for everyone to read. It was a little bit more polished, uh, but I recommend both. So what was the, how long did it take you to write the first book? And then what was the process from the first book to the second book? And then maybe you want to uh, get into the story about the documentary. And yeah, then... yeah, for sure. So the first book took about two years off and on. There were times that I would read it. I mean, I would start writing. And I would write a chapter and, I, and I'm like, I'm not a writer. I'm not a writer. I'm done. And I wouldn't even touch it for two months. And then I would get back at it and start writing again. Uh, something like a movie like Remember the Titans would inspire me and I would start back writing again. And uh, so it took about two years off and on and, and to, to get it out in the world. And I hustled. I was just dropping books off at schools, at boathouses, like everywhere, just giving them away, right? So people can read it. And that's how Mary Mazio, our film director, um, read the book that someone just sent her the book. And I said, read this. And she read the book. And she tweeted at me right away, Arshe Cooper, great story. And I looked up her work and I, and I called her. I was like, hey, you know, Rowan Ro teach you to go after it. I go after everything. And I'm like, would you want to do a story, a documentary? And she was like, yes. And I was like, all right, in order to make this, make this happen, I need you to come to Chicago and see my city. I need you to spend a few days. You know, I know the media give you eyesight. I want to give you insight. And, um, and so she came down and me and Alvin took her on a ride around and um, you know, she met our families and, um, you know, we went to the lagoon and just, um, the whole trip and she right away, she's like, I have to call Grant Hill, the NBA player. And Grant Hill was like, I got to reach out to Dwayne Wade, you know? And it's like, well, we got to reach out to common. And they all just fell in love with the story and, and, and those guys. And, and from there, this buzz was, um, you know, traveling around the wrong world and, 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 and there was a literary agent who heard about the story, who didn't hear about the story before. And she said, Arshay, I wanna, I wanna bring this book to the world. I wanna take it to the world. And I think it deserves a bigger audience. And, um, and so that's how that happened. And then um, we started filming and it was, it was just awesome to get the guys back together. And, and we thought that we should race again. And, and, and that our moms should see us and the kids should see us and the principal who never and the teachers who never had a chance to see us, they all came out. And, it, you know, we all, if you saw it in the, you saw the film, we all had different reasons uh, for coming back to the water. And I think that the biggest reason was for the last 20 years, Preston would say, I wish I didn't quit the team. Every time I see him, I wish I, I wish I can just go back. And when Mary put together the outline of the film, it was just the history of the team, the first half of the film. And I said, Mary, I think I want Preston to go back. We need to race again. And that's when we started training. And I started calling the Olympic coach. And, and we went on this whole journey of just losing weight and, and engaging with um, folks in the community and, and, and putting this film out to the world. So can you bring us up to date on some of the some of the teammates, Preston and the others that I think you're still in contact with all of them, right? Yeah, I'm in contact with all of them. Um, 90%, you know, <laughs> I spoke at a conference. Me and Ken spoke at a conference um, like a couple years back. And someone said, well, how many of those guys went on to be Olympic rowers? You know, and I was like, none, but 90% of them are entrepreneurs and they hire people in their community. And, you know, every guy would tell you that we loved entrepreneurship because we all wanted to make money. How do we make money? How do we make money? You know, and, and we had to sit in entrepreneurship classes on Thursdays. And that's where we learned to shake a hand. Someone's hand. that's where we learned how to look someone in the eye. That's what we learned about the marketplace. That's what we learned about the needs of the community, uh, the economy, uh, how to network, right? And, 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 and how to take risks. And, and so, those guys use those same tools um, to, to become entrepreneurs. So you have Alvin who has a huge moving company and he hires high school seniors so they can pay for their graduation and their proms. And then you have older guys in the community that he hired, not only just to stay a mover, but these are guys who 
it's, it's hard for them to find a job. So he has someone to come in to give resume classes and, and, and to teach them how to write a, a cover letter and, and how to interview. And you have Preston who, who, who owns a barbershop, right? And he gives free haircuts on Sundays, which is special to, to um, the young people in, in the community. You have Malcolm who owns a trucking company in Ohio. You have Pookie who live in Dallas and he works for United Healthcare. And we have all the other teammates that weren't in the film, but still all working hard and, 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 and own their own business. And, and, and um, we have a group chat and we, we love each other. We are brothers and uh, we continue to, to protect each other and, and help each other out. That's great. Um, here's, a, here's somebody who wrote, this is, there's a, two parts to this question. I love how you got into the head of yourself as a young teenage boy, including all the distractions, love life, gang decisions. You wrote this years later. How did you get back into that mindset? And then the second question is, also, I like how no one is above guilt or responsibility for finding a better way instead of dragging things down. So for those outside of the community, what would you recommend to provide more support to youth on the West Side? Good question. Um, what was the first question again? Sorry. Did, first one to... was, how did you get back into the head of yourself? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I, um, wow, that was rough. The, I mean, that was, that, that was the hard part of writing, you know, talking to my mom, sitting there, talking, I never wanted to talk to her about any of this stuff again. You know, it was like in the past and, and sitting there and, and sharing these stories. And then some of my memories was different from her memories, you know, and, 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 um, and so we sat there and talked and cried and, 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 you know, I took notes and then going to Manly High School and smelling the hallways and, and remembering Grace and being in the lunchroom, uh, brought back memories and, and talking. And, and for the guys, Alvin, Preston, and Malcolm, we got together every year and talked about the same stuff. So it never lost our mind, the same jokes, the same stories. Um, but there were times of being alone, writing about my dad, um, writing about some of the thoughts I had as a young person or poetry and, and <clears throat> my first job cleaning toilets. And there was times I had to just slam my computer to close my computer because it was hard to write about. But I had to just take myself there again. And I think some people say things like this breakup or losing someone or this certain situation in my life, I would never want to relive again. But the hardest part is that I had to go back and relive all those things. And that was tough. But I knew without a shadow of doubt that there are young people, their parents, their coaches are all going through the same things that we were going through 20 years ago. And I felt like it was important to act beyond myself. And, and, and put the story out there. And I think the second thing is, is to support the community is really just listening to their stories, right? On social media and books, in the media. Um, I think that when we listen to those who are hurting, number one, our moral compass will point us in the right direction. I think number two, we get connected to a nonprofit uh, and ask questions and learn without first without saying I want to come in and help learn right and educate yourself and read books and, and, and talk to people and, and, and join multicultural groups and um, and from there we ask what do you, what community what do you need teachers what do you need uh, families what do you need and I think and, and help move the community and those organizations with their ideas, with those young people ideas. Every team that I help start, I say to coaches, I, I wanna move the organization with the young people ideas. I think that is best. And, and, and we develop a youth leadership crew for kids who are in rowing and not in rowing. And, and we ask what do they wanna see and, and what are their fears? And, and, and we build an organization based on that. And so I think, I think that is important because if you go into a community and, and, and think again, like some people thought our program was a, was a failure because, you know, we didn't win gold medals, but it was success, a big success for everybody in our community. So what is success to the community and how can we help them reach that success? 
I think a couple people are interested in knowing um, because Coach Jessica was such a big part of the book, but she's not in the documentary anymore. Are you still in touch with her? Yeah, we just did a panel together an hour ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, she she's older, so she had some um, pregnancy complications. And I think, um, and, I, and I said, there's no way you can uh, film. And she said, honestly, Arshe, I want to get the hell out the way. This is your story. And uh, if I can support you outside the film, I'm going to do whatever I can, but I'm getting the hell out the way. That's what she said. And she said, give someone else from the community an opportunity to say something. That's great. Going back to the film, uh, it's for those who, those who have seen it will know that you brought in members of the Chicago Police Department to join you on your 20 year reunion rowing race. Uh, what inspired you to do that? And has that connection continued with folks in the community? Yeah, um, that was, that was, you know, throughout the process of filming, I have to say the producers were a little upset, so obsessed about the, the different gangs and the disconnect between different gangs. And I was like, well, that's not the only disconnect. There's a disconnect between the black community and police officers. And I spent my life really addressing the issues around gang activity. And I also wanted to address the issue around the disconnect between black lives and, and law enforcement. And so, you know, I said to the guys, I was like, I want to invite the police officers to come row with us. And they were like, what, 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 what? And I said, here's the thing. As teachers, you will always forget some of your students, but as a student, you'll never forget your teacher. And we have an opportunity to be the teacher. We have the opportunity to lead here. You know, and I knew that when someone goes into a community like the West Side of Chicago as an employee, if it's a teacher or a security guard or a business store owner or a crossing guard, the initial thought is to get to know the community in, in names. And I was like, they work here, cops work here eight hours a day and I think they need to learn our names. And I wanna learn their names. And if they can learn my name or our kid's name, maybe it will stop us from posting, say their names. And, and so, um, you know, while the moms were on set, there was two, there's two things that scare them, their interaction with their, their, their kid in a different neighborhood or their interaction between the kid and the police officer. And I wanted to, I wanted to address both and work on both. And I know sports unites people, so I invited them out and it was a little awkward at first, uh, but you know, the lessons that I teach in the sport of rowing, the unity that the sport brings, the healing that the sport brings, I taught those lessons to the cops when they were there. And I wanted them just to, I wanted to refocus the lens and give them a different interaction. Like at the end of practicing with us every single day, they learned that Preston wears his hoodie and sags his pants, but he's a great entrepreneur. They learned that Alvin didn't make bad choices, but hard choices to protect his family and to survive. They learned that Malcolm calls his son every 10 minutes, that men, black men there love their kids and they care about their kids. One of the things they notice is that the kids at the bull house, some, some will come in and uh, that are white and in their Ubers and some that are black will come taking two buses, right? A scene with the guys teaching their kids how to row, the cops were there for that, watching. And, and I think the, the biggest surprise is that one of the, the, the police officers in the boat um, didn't know how to swim. We didn't know. And the boat was shaking. And you had Alvin who did time and he sat behind him and he said, sit tall, breathe. I got your back. I got you. Don't worry. Sit tall. This is how you hold the oar. And walked him through it. And then the boat stopped shaking and then you felt the connection in the boat. And, um, and I think that's what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to build a connection because no matter who disagrees or what people thought about it. I knew at the end of the day that when our teenagers wake up the next morning that these are the cops that they have to interact with. And now that they know their names, it makes me feel a little bit more safe. And, and I think that they were appreciative that they know these kids' names. I learned that the, the high rates of suicide among those who are police officers, right? And, and to trace that back for what they go through and what they see in these neighborhoods and what we see all goes back to 
redlining and segregation and Jim Crow laws and all these different things that it traced back to. And so, um, and that's why I did it. So after George Floyd was murdered, to get a call from a cop that said, I feel your pain, I feel the pain of your community and send me pictures of him working with black community leaders meant something to me. To see Big Lou, who was scared, post on his Instagram page, yes, Black Lives Matter. These are the things that you don't see at a protest. To have a cop, we have a group chat, so we talk all the time. We always chatting and talking. And a couple of weeks ago, when the cop said, you know, I had a lot of bricks thrown at me at these protests, he said, but I can take my uniform off, but you can't take your black skin off. And I said, you're right. How do you tell your colleagues that? And how do I tell my colleagues the things that you're going through? And so, you know, there's so many movements out there that works, it's just like the movements in the 60s. You had the Black Panther movement, civil rights movement. You had Malcolm X, you had James Baldwin and the NAACP. There are many different movements that we need today, but my way has always been bridging people together through sports and uh, education through conversation. And, and, uh, and, and, and that's what I'm gonna continue to do, work, work in my gift things. You're clearly great at what you do. Amy? Um, so somebody asked, they're on the rowing team at Nutrier where my son rowed to, um, and they have an African-American coach now. In light of recent events, the coaches started to open up about the adversity he faced as a black coach in a predominantly, overwhelmingly white sport. What type of adversity have you faced within the sport of rowing? I'm sorry, hello? Yeah. Oops. I lost you, Amy, I'm sorry, I lost okay. you. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So somebody, it. can you hear me now? I hear you now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Somebody wrote in that they are on the new chair rowing team and they have an African-American coach who has started to open up about the adversity he faced as a black coach in a predominantly white sport. So we've heard some things about this, but what type of adversity did you face within the sport of rowing when yeah. you started out? Uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Young people face a lot today. I think, you know, as a young person, a lot of the adversity was, you know, sometimes we recruit kids into an all white space like Roy without letting the space know of white kids that black kids will be coming, right? And without letting us know that the kind of world we're going to be entering, right? And I think that it's important to address those issues with the young people. I mean, we shared a bow house with private school kids um, who worked hard. We worked hard, but spent a year without even speaking to each other, right? And I think that, uh, you know, and we, we never even had a shot of, of, of just like really breaking down stereotypes. I think that's something that we would have learned a lot from as, as young people. But I think having, you know, always the stairs, but as an adult, you know, I just told the story in the last call that someone came up to me and said, a well-known, very popular college coach said, hey, you the kid that you the kid that was in that pet project growing program, right? And I was like, what? Like I had blisters, I had back injuries, I worked hard, right? Pet project. You know, I had to call him out on that. I had people who pet my head. I had people to say very racist things. I dealt with a lot in the sport of growing. I took a group of kids out a couple years ago to a regatta, and we experienced the same thing, you know, and the cashier. At a gas station told me my kids have to all the black kids who row have to come in one at a time and when i called the guy from springfield rowing team they was like no we didn't have to do that you know race issues still exist and for me it was hard because not only i had to prepare for race days which is mentally exhausting i had to prepare for race issues and that's exhausting right and that's something we deal with every day and my message to the rowing world every time that as rowers, we understand when we're on that erg machine and when we're rowing to get the results that we want, we have to be uncomfortable the whole time, pulling, uncomfortable the whole time to get the results that we want. And in this sport, to truly be diverse, to truly be inclusive, right? We all have to have the uncomfortable conversation to get the results that we want. We all agree that we want the bow house in every city to reflect the diversity in this country. In order to do that, we have to have an uncomfortable conversation. We have to educate ourselves. We have to take DEI training and we also have to educate the young people. And we also have to make sure that 
the decor, the languages, the images reflects the kids that we're trying to put in our seats at the boathouse. And that's very important. And, uh, and that's something that, you know, there's a huge DI committee with US Rowing now and, uh, and so many groups that I'm working with and college coaches to, to help address some of those issues. Are you working with uh, the Olympic Committee? Was that part of your film too? Were you? Um, so I, um, well, I work, we work with the Olympic team to race, but US rowing is like bigger than the Olympic team. So I was a part of the, um, the diversity and inclusion uh, task force and uh, with trying to figure out what are some of the efforts we can do with uh, equity and inclusion and diversity and representation in this sport. So yes, I'm very much involved with them and, and, and work with the NRF board, that's the National Rowing Foundation, who's in charge of the Olympics. Um, and, and again, and all collegiate coaches, uh, what they can do to make their uh, program more warm and welcoming. So I read. Go ahead, Amy. Okay, I've read in a couple of um, interviews that um, you were stopped by a police officer for no reason several times, but one particular police officer you um, saw when you were working as a barista. And can you tell us what happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was pulled over by a cop, and um, in the West Loop. I was going to Ken's place and I was going to Le Cordon Bleu and I was working at um, Starbucks uh, in Little Italy. And I was also working um, for um, Blackbird, the restaurant Blackbird. So I was doing, <laughs> doing a lot of work and he pulled me over and, and I was just, I was upset. Like why you pulled me over? And you know, his partner was more rude. Like she was just like at me and a lot of cop, cop cars came and, they took me to the police station and Jenny came and she took, you know, and, and I went home and, and it was really no reason to be pulled over. And so the next, the for a couple of days, I was, I was there at, at work and this cop came in, Mr. Mr. Morales. And, um, and he looked at me and I was like, Hey, how you doing? He said, he was, he looked at me. He was like, I am, what he said, he said, I'm so sorry. Um, tell you a good, good kid, I'm sorry. And he just apologized. And I'm like, why you put, and I could have said, why did you pull me over? But I said, you know what? Your coffee and your scone is on me. That's all I said. And he looked and he had his head down and, and he came back in a couple of days later and I was taking my lunch break. And I was like, oh, have a, have a seat. And he was like, hey, we having a poker night. You want to come? And I was like, I don't know if I go to poker night, but I'm going to Hawkeyes if you want to go to Hawkeyes, you know, and so we went to Hawkeyes Bar and Grill. And my friends were there, Alvin, and then some of his colleagues in uniform was there. And we had a conversation. And so at 19 years old, this wasn't the first time I brought the neighborhood and cops together. At 19 years old, I had a barbecue and I invited him and all these guys. And I invited all my friends that I grew up with. And we had it in Ken's and Jenny's backyard. And um, it was an awesome event. And, and, and I remember having a conversation. He said, what we need to work on is, 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 um, is, what did he say? Um, um, the way we talk to people, right? You know, the way we talk to the community. And then I talked to him about a few things. And then years later, he's at my wedding. We go to Bears games together. We are really good friends. And we have a lot of conversations, right? And, 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 and it is good to be able to not just talk to people who, 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 who are not cops about the situation around cops. So to be able to, to talk to cops and, and hold them accountable and, and address issues is, um, is, is a very powerful thing. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of our participants said, it seems that rowing became a coping mechanism for you. Were you afraid to lose it after high school was over? I didn't want to lose that bond, that friendship, that experience with the water. So I stayed close. Um, so although I was in school, I volunteered coach, right? Because I wanted to continue to have a relationship with, with the water. But I think, you know, again, I didn't go to cooking school right away. I went to AmeriCorps first because I wanted to also be a part of change and want to give my year, give, dedicate a year of my life to service. 
And so I was working with young people, working with people who don't look like me and, and learning from each other. And I was also still part of the, uh, the water and, and coaching in the young kids' lives. So I never lost it because I, I, I couldn't get away from it and, 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 uh, and it wasn't going to get rid of me. And so, um, I, I, you know, so yeah, I, I was afraid I could lose it, but I knew that, you know, if, if, if I can just stay with it, that I'll be okay, you know, that things would be fine. Where did you do AmeriCorps? Uh, I did AmeriCorps actually in Chicago at Roosevelt High School and at South Shore High School. So here's a question about, because some of the um, team members were members of gangs. What was the reaction of the gangs um, for their commitment to the rowing program? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, there's a part in the, in the film, in the barbershop, where Pooh said, when they tore down the YMCA, when the YMCA lost funding, I ran to the streets. And I ran to the streets, and that's where I started selling drugs. I remember that YMCA. 150 kids were there. That's where the counselors were at, the coaches were at, the chess coaches. And then they shut down the YMCA, and all these kids are hanging with the streets. And the guys in the street would say, hey, you know, you need a pair of shoes, I'll take care of you, but you have to hang out with us, right? If you want to belong, come here. And then rowing came, Pooh left the gang, it started rowing, right? The kids are hungry, they need the opportunity, they just want to belong. But there's a lot of places shutting down um, and everybody want opportunity. I worked with so many gang members and there's never been a gang member who I said, hey, here's a job making $25 an hour, you can start next week. And they stop selling drugs and they, and they start working. And so the response of the gangs was like, that's great. That's awesome. Keep doing what you're doing. Not, there's never been a time when it was like, really? You're gonna row? You know, people made fun of us at school for rowing, but the gang members understood, man, that it's life and death out there. And they would tell you to get out. Uh, there's times I get so upset and I start cursing and the gang members say, not you, you don't curse, not you. You know what I mean? Like, you, like you, 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 we believe in you, man, you know? so. That kind of stuff happened. So we didn't get a really bad reaction from the gang. It was like more of like the football players would make fun of us and say it's not a real sport and, and mess with us a little bit. But the gangs were like, you know, th that's dope. Keep doing what you're doing because they saw the progress. They saw that we were traveling. They saw all the good things that were happening in our lives. And, 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 and they, was, they was okay because people joined the gang to, for protection, you know, and, and, um, and for the most part, they, they would still look out for some, some of the guys in the next that was on the team. I think we have time for just about two more questions. Uh, well, let's try this one. It seems like you have a passion for bringing people together. You are an obvious connector. That's very apparent. Is that something that comes directly from rowing? And if not, where do you think it came from? Yeah, I think it came from two different things. I think that when my mom got uh, went to recovery, she started going to the church. I was like, I fell in love with the choir director. How the choir, all these different people, how a choir director can take a voice that meows like a cat and a voice that sounds like thunder and drums and instruments and kind of make this one sound. And, 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 and I was in, I wanted to do that. I wanted to be a choir director, but I didn't know anything about music, but how can I do that with people? that were different from different place, different perspective. How can I get them together and make one sound? And, and that was just the thought process. I knew I wanted to do it, but I had no tools to do it. I had no idea how. I didn't know how to be a leader. I didn't know how to be a team player, right? But I knew inside it, I want to. And so what rowing did is it gave me the tools and the lessons, right? And, uh, and, 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 and I learned how to be a leader, how, to get people together, right? To find alignment in the boat is the number one thing that you want to do. And so in order for me to find alignment with people, I have to get to know them. I have to understand them, right? You know, I didn't like Alvin at first, but I had to understand why he was doing what he was doing, right? I had to talk to the cops and understand them, right? And build trust to sports, right? And so, um, you know, Rowan gave me those tools and it taught me how to find a alignment and how to get everyone connected and how to get everyone feeling the rhythm in the same boat and in the same community and moving together. Great. 
Well, I'm going to ask one more and then we have one final one after that. So an interesting part of the book talked about how when you first started practicing, you all were eating junk food when you like for your breaks and then you switched to healthier food and found that it made a difference. Um, but for inner city kids, it's very often hard to find access to good food. So do you think that's improved at all? Do you have any insight into that? Yeah, that, that, yeah, that, that's, that's tough. That is hard. And I, I think the improvement that I've seen, even in Chicago, the amount of young people uh, in this programs, if, if you research it, they're all about growing food now and, mm -hmm. and, and nonprofits, um, they're really working with families around how to grow food and also sell that food uh, at different markets, right? And I think that it, it only does a little bit, but it is something. And I think it's something that we as growers and the committee and the team that I'm working with, how do we address that and use that as part of our package and our fundraising and our model to make sure that they're eating healthy foods and not as just educating the kid, but what, is, what can we give the families and what can we deliver to them that's, uh, that incorporate that food in, in part of our, our, uh, our model to making sure that kids and their families have healthy food. And, and that's through workshops and many different things, but there's something that we're working on, but it's also not starting our program on how to grow food either, either but also giving some of that money and those tools to the people that's already doing the work with growing the food and helping them and partner with them to give them the tools, they're the experts. So it's really partnerships. Good. Um, and then last question, because a lot of people have asked variations on this. You've been so instrumental in introducing a lot of young people uh, to rowing, especially in low income neighborhoods. Can you describe a program or two and tell us what people can do to help provide these opportunities. And But I should say that we are in the follow-up email tomorrow. We'll let people know, number one, some of the links where they can help, and number two, how they can watch the movie through um, Peacock at no charge. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So Row New York is one of the biggest, most diverse organizations out there. You can look them up. You have St. Benedict's. We have Philadelphia City Rowan. We also have Chicago Training Center in Chicago that I'm going to be working closely with to make sure it's a free program for kids uh, in, a, in a neighborhood. And a lot of these programs that I go into and help start and work with is to make sure that we incorporate not only rowing, but youth, youth development, DEI training for coaches, academic support, college readiness, and social emotional learning and mentorship. These are all the programs that me and my team work with. So we started the most, the most beautiful thing fund, which brings that model, right? The, that crew, just like they did at Manly into these schools and into these cities. And we start a rowing program and we teach healing through the, through the sport. Also how to be more competitive. And um, I am so excited, but the model again is rowing, academic support, social emotional learning, college readiness, and getting kids recruited to college. Right, and, and, and that holistic coaching and giving the coaches the tools they need and the community development they need to do the work. And so that's a little bit of, of my work and I am super excited about it. There's so much work to come in Chicago. So you can find more about that uh, on po the Pocock Foundation website or Most Beautiful Thing Fund. And also I'm always posting things on, on Instagram. You can uh, catch me on Instagram, um, Arshay Cooper or or on my website, but there's a lot of exciting things happening. So stay tuned. Um, Fila has dropped a most beautiful thing shoe that's coming out. The, the documentary is coming out on Amazon Prime as well, October 30th. And the soundtrack to the uh, film is dropping October 30th. We are now working with members uh, of Congress like Danny Davis around the, the issue of mental health and trauma. So I am super excited about that. And there's a lot of people that's rallying around uh, this fund to make sure that we give young people the tools they need to be successful rowers. That's all great. What, yeah. a, what a great note to, to end on. Arshe, we wanna thank you so much, not only for sharing your story with the world, but for uh, sharing with it, it with us and taking the time to be with us tonight. 
I think we can all agree that you are an, such an inspiration. This has been such a memorable evening. Your spirit, your energy are absolutely infectious. So we don't think we could have chosen a better author or book to kick off our virtual author programming. And we thank you again so much for being here. We also want to thank all of you who have joined us this evening for our first foray into the virtual author world, author event world. Uh, we appreciate all of your insightful questions and we do apologize for not being able to get to all of them. Please watch, as Amy said, for an email that will come tomorrow from the library. It will include more information about our Shea, about the book, about the film. Also remember that you can order a signed copy of the book from Semicolon Bookstore in Chicago, perfect for yourself or for gift giving. And a link for purchase of the book will also be included in the email. With that, we wanna wish you all a wonderful rest of your evening. Hope you stay safe. Good night. Thank you. Good night.